everybody, I am That Nursing Prof and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be discussing placenta previa. So what is that? The placenta previa is when a placenta abnormally implants in the uterus and covers completely or somewhat covers the cervical os. There's three different types, so let's go through them. The first of which is the complete or a total previa, which is when the placenta implants right over the cervical os. So it completely covers it. An incomplete or partial is where part of the placenta is where it's supposed to be, but then there's a part that also covers, you know, the cervical os. And then a marginal or a low-lying placenta, you've probably heard of that maybe, the low-lying placenta. That's when it doesn't technically cover it, but it's right there. Okay? This is usually diagnosed if you get good prenatal care on your first ultrasound. Okay, on your first, you know, good solid ultrasound, they might see this. And sometimes they can resolve on their own. This one, this marginal one, is the most likely to resolve on its own. Meaning, it scoots its little self back up there and you can give birth vaginally. Very unlikely that an incomplete or a complete resolves on its own. Usually, in this situation, it's going to be like this the whole time and mom's going to have to have a C-section. So who's at risk for having a placenta previa? Of course, anyone who's had one before, right? So anyone with a previous previa. AMA stands for advanced maternal age. So any mamas over the age of 35. Closely spaced pregnancies. So if you're currently pregnant and you just had a baby very recently within the past, you know, couple of months or a year or two, okay? So having them very close together, having babies very close together is a risk factor because of the exfoliation process of the uterus postpartum. Anybody with uterine scarring, so things that could cause uterine scarring would be like a previous C-section or endometritis, which is an infection of the endometrium that can happen sometimes postpartum. That can cause scarring of the uterus, and if the uterus is scarred at the placenta implantation site from the previous pregnancy, when this new placenta tries to go in that area, it's not going to work, right? It's going to go, oh, I guess I can't go here, I'll have to go somewhere else, and then it'll migrate itself down. So, scarring is probably the biggest one. And then, finally, multiples. So, if you have more than one baby in there, twins, triplets, etc., Sometimes the babies need to move around and everything needs to adjust and the placenta goes, you know what, I'm going to go over here and then the babies can go over there and we'll just make it work. Okay, so that's another risk factor. Signs and symptoms, the big thing with this one, painless bright red bleeding. Okay, it's bright red because it's so close to the surface, all these blood vessels, right, but it doesn't hurt. Okay, and that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because, of course, we don't want our patients to be in pain. But when they are in pain, they're more likely to tell us about it, right? If somebody's having a little bit of bleeding, they may or may not know to call the doctor or to let the nurse know if it doesn't hurt. So it's a good thing and it's a bad thing, but it's the hallmark sign. If you're ever wondering, like, what's the placenta preview? What do I need to know about it? Know that it is painless, bright red blood. The uterus will be soft on assessment, okay? Their fundal height, when you go to do their fundal height measurement, it'll be higher than you would expect it to be. Meaning, if you think they're gonna be 28 weeks and you do the fundal height and they're 34 weeks, okay? So not what you expected them to be. And then it's usually associated with fetal male presentation. And that's what I drew here in the pictures, okay? So in this one, we have a transverse baby, so horizontal, and in these two, we have a breech baby. Now, in this situation, could the baby possibly be cephalic, head down, and then the low-lying placenta resolves and she can give birth vaginally? Yeah, that happens. Um, but usually associated with fetal male presentation, so either a transverse lie or a breech. Our nursing interventions. What does the nurse need to know about taking care of a placenta previa patient? Honestly, it kind of depends. It depends on what kind of previa it is. So obviously we're gonna treat a complete versus a marginal a little bit differently. And then also, is she in her first trimester or is she term and ready to deliver? 
right? So all of these factors kind of come into play. So what I've done is I've made a list of some things that we might do depending on how far along they are and what's going on with them. The first of which is, if they're bleeding, we're going to assess that bleeding. Luckily, for most women who have a placenta previa, the first incidence of bleeding, the first time they start noticing that they're bleeding, is not enough to hurt the baby, which is a good thing, right? And it also informs us that, hey, something's going on here, right? So assess that bleeding. We're going to count and ideally weigh the pads. We're going to be doing fundal height, just like here in our signs and symptoms. We're going to be doing Leopold's maneuvers because we're going to be checking for baby's presentation because, again, often male presentation. Vital signs. We're worried about hypovolemic shock. We're worried about a dangerous amount of blood loss or a hemorrhage, right? And so that will be evident in the vital signs. We're going to give volume expanders, usually lactated ringers, so IV fluids. She's going to be on bed rest at a minimum, <laughs> at a minimum, or pelvic rest. So bed rest meaning she actually has to stay in bed and can get up to go to the bathroom and things like that, but that's about it. Pelvic rest meaning she can do normal things, she can live her daily life, but nothing in the vagina, like no intercourse, no anything else. Fetal heart rate monitoring, definitely we're going to be checking to make sure uh, baby's doing okay and how are they handling this. An ultrasound, that's probably how we're going to diagnose it initially if they don't have that initial bleeding. We're going to see the placentas in the wrong spot. We're going to be doing an H&H. &H. We're going to get a baseline and then we're also going to be doing follow-up H&Hs to see about blood loss and how much she's actually lost. Of course, we want to do a blood type and an RH factor because if she is actively bleeding, we always have to be thinking about we need to replace that blood. Okay, so possible blood transfusion. And I put it down here. So anything with the little red star next to it is not stuff that like we always do all the time. It's situation dependent. So for example, a blood transfusion. We're always going to check the H&H. &H. We're always going to get her blood type and RH factor. But we don't always need to do a blood transfusion on these patients. Sometimes we do though. So that's why it's on this list. I skipped over Rogam. For a reason, it's got a little red star next to it too. So if we do the RH factor and we find mom is RH negative, then she will get Rogam. If we do it and she's not, then Rogam is not necessary for her. Rogam is given anytime there's any kind of bleeding during pregnancy. Corticosteroids may be necessary. So if she is term and ready to deliver, we don't care. We're not doing that. Okay, if she is preterm and we have to deliver her and we can't do anything about it, an ideal situation would be to give her some beta-methasone, which is a corticosteroid, which will help fetal lung maturity. So it's going to help baby after it's born survive a little bit easier. And then finally, emergency C-section. And that can vary, right? It can vary by how far along you are, how bad your previa is, how bad your bleeding is, how, you know, baby's handling it, is baby not handling it well, and we need to have this baby right now to save its life, that kind of stuff. So lots of variables that go into our nursing interventions. We do have a mnemonic device to help us remember some of the key aspects of placenta previa. So the P is for painless, bright red bleeding. So that's the hallmark sign, right? R is to replace blood loss. So this could be either through a blood transfusion, if it's at that level, or IV fluid replacement. Evidence in the lower uterine segment, meaning the placenta is covering the ass, right? Or somewhere near the ass. V is for vitals. Vitals may indicate shock, right? So hypovolemic shock, that's what we're concerned about here. I is for inspecting the fetal heart rate. So how is baby handling it? And then A is avoiding vaginal examinations. So the reason we want to do that is think about it. You're going to check your patient and you go to do your vag exam and you poke the placenta and now they're hemorrhaging, right? Now you've made it so much worse, right? So we want to avoid vaginal exams because we want to prevent them from bleeding 
more than they even have to, more than they already are. So that's my video on placenta previa. I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you have any questions or comments, please let me know. If not, I'll see you on the next one.